Let the Bible Speak, with your speaker, Brett Hickey. In an age when some of the most popular preachers in America will mention neither sin nor hell in their preaching, I find it fascinating that Jesus preaches against sin and warns against the consequences of hell in his first and most famous sermon. What sin did Jesus first preach against? An article by Rick Nowak in CNN.com on December 4th, 2011, titled, World War II Bombs Diffused, Allowing 45,000 Evacuated Residents to Return, reports that bomb squads in Germany successfully diffused on Sunday two bombs and disposed of an additional airdrop military device that had caused an evacuation of historic proportions in a city in the country's west. Life had come to a standstill in the western German city of Koblenz, where 45,000 people had been evacuated after the discovery of several dangerous World War II bombs. For 65 years, the Rhine River hid two bombs in a fog-producing device that were dropped by American and British warplanes in the last years of the war. When water levels dropped to record lows last week, the article continues, the bombs were finally found. The deactivation of bombs is a common practice in Germany. Last year, a bomb exploded in the German town Gottingen, killing three members of a bomb disposal squad. A 1994 article titled, War's Lethal Leftovers Threaten Europeans, by AP reporter Christopher Burns reads, the bombs of World War II are still killing in Europe. They turn up, and sometimes blow up, at construction sites, in fishing nets, or on beaches 50 years after the guns fell silent. Hundreds of tons of explosives are recovered every year in France alone. Thirteen old bombs exploded in France last year, killing 12 people and wounding 11, the Interior Ministry said. Unexploded bombs become more dangerous with time. With the corrosion inside, the weapon becomes more unstable. The detonator can be exposed. What is true of undiffused bombs is also true of undiffused anger. Without any warning, unsuspecting victims can experience severe injuries from a massive explosion. How many people are you endangering? by old bombs that you have left behind. Consider the danger anger holds for you and those around you. This issue is so serious that it is the very first sin that Jesus preaches about in the Sermon on the Mount. We read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. This morning, we're going to look at the danger with anger after our song.
An AP release appearing in USA Today on April 5, 2007, suggested that the most infamous feud in American folklore, the long-running battle between the Hatfields and McCoys, may be partly explained by a rare inherited disease that can lead to hair-trigger rage and violent outbursts. Others, of course, dispute the findings. The article mentions, though, later that the hostilities between the Hatfields and McCoys had surfaced as recently as January 2003. McCoy descendants sued Hatfield descendants over visitation rights to a small cemetery on an Appalachian hillside in eastern Kentucky that hold the remains of six McCoys, some allegedly killed by the Hatfields. The Hatfields and McCoys have a storied and deadly history dating to Civil War times with generations fighting over land, timber rights, and even a pig, resulting in at least a dozen dead. Some sources say that scores of both families have been killed through the years from this feud. Everyone acknowledges the murders by the Hatfields and McCoys violate the law of God. But Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount that wrongdoing occurs before actual murder takes place. In referring to the sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill, Jesus teaches one way in which, as he taught in Matthew 5.20, our righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. He said again in Matthew 5, verse 21 and 22, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. That's Jesus. These religious leaders believed that they were righteous as long as their anger and hatred for their fellow man did not lead to murder. Jesus sets the record straight. Robertson writes in his word pictures of the New Testament that Jesus goes further than the law into the very heart. After expressing disapproval for improper anger, Jesus addresses the calling of one raka, an Aramaic word meaning empty, a frequent word for contempt. Robertson says, the second word is Greek for dull, stupid, and is a fair equivalent of raka. He then quotes Bruce who writes, raka expresses contempt for a man's head, you stupid. Mare expresses contempt for his heart and character you scoundrel. Clearly, Jesus is teaching that we must do more than avoid murder. We must avoid the bitterness, anger, and hatred that leads to murder. The Holy Spirit tells us in 1 John 3, 15, whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. When we fail to control our temper, we do and say that which is harmful and foolish. According to ESPN.com, 260-pound University of Kansas football player Dion Rayford got stuck in a Taco Bell drive through window when he tried to attack employees who left the chalupa out of his order. Rayford was charged with several misdemeanors and was suspended from playing in his last collegiate football game. What was it over? A chalupa. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9, Do not hasten in your spirit to be angry, for anger rests in the bosom of fools. We can see this certainly in the Taco Bell bully, but often fail to see it in ourselves. Fourteen centuries ago, so-called Gregory the Great labeled anger one of the seven deadly sins. Every sin is deadly, of course, but we often downplay anger. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, one out of every four women and one out of every nine men in the United States are victims of domestic violence at some point in their lives. Up to 10 million children witness some form of domestic violence annually. Up to 12,000 road rage deaths are reported every year. 
Columbine is the most famous example of school rage, but Columbine is certainly not alone. In 2008, 279 cases of air rage were reported. The most bizarre case included a man in the United States who stripped naked in a display of his frustration. Media rage? A guest on the Jenny Jones program in 1995 was murdered after he revealed a homosexual crush on another guest. A guest on the Jerry Springer show was convicted of murder in 2002 in a similar case. And now, a guest on People's Court is missing the day after her appearance with her ex-husband. Sports rage? You would think that the National Football League would provide sufficient opportunity to release one's frustrations before the whistle blows. But players have been guilty of stepping on another's face mask after the play. In September, a 14-year-old tackled a referee after the play. Afterwards, coaches, parents, and other players kicked the fallen referee while he was on the ground. God does not approve. Not okay. The Bible says in Galatians 5, verse 16, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. The apostle goes on to, to write in verses 19 through 20. Now, some of these are surprising, some are not. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, or sexual immorality, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. This list of attitudes and behaviors that will keep us out of heaven include adultery and sexual immorality, idolatry, murder and drunkenness. We're not surprised about that, but I think some of us might be surprised to find that this list includes a series of anger and hate-related sins. People tend not to take these so seriously. Hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, and then the apostle says, and such like, or similar, similar things. The problem, as Benjamin Franklin put it, is anger is never without a reason, but seldom is it a good one. Sometimes there is good reason for anger. Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Anger is a God-given emotion just like joy, sadness, and fear. Anger is a gift from God. But just as we can pervert other gifts of God by misuse, sleeping can become slothfulness, eating can become gluttony, and marital, marital intimacy can be traded for adultery, so anger too can cross the line. The Bible says in Psalm 7 verse 11 that God is angry with the wicked every day. Anger can energize us in righting a wrong. It can serve as a catalyst for reserving interpersonal conflicts. Jesus' anger was certainly justified in Matthew 21, verse 12 and 13, when he overthrew the tables of the money changers in the temple. He said afterwards, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And this was prophesied, of course, in Zechariah. William Secker says, he that would be angry and not sin must be angry at nothing but sin. Some circumstances should make us angry. We should be upset about innocent children being abused or aborted. We should be angry when God's Word is twisted and corrupted. David wrote in Psalm 119, verse 104, Through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Unfortunately, we often get angry when we should not and fail to get angry when we should. We can usually recognize the difference by asking, am I angry because someone else is wounded? 
Am I angry because God's Word or the church has been damaged or endangered? Or am I angry for selfish purposes because my pride has been wounded or because I have been cheated in some way? Even in these selfish reasons, anger is not out of place if it is handled correctly with resolution and reconciliation being sought appropriately. We must be careful, though. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, 31, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. In a similar passage in Colossians 3, verse 8, the Holy Spirit says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Inappropriate anger, being too angry, angry too long, or angry too often, leads to physical health issues, backaches, headaches, high blood pressure, insomnia, digestive disorders, skin disorders, stroke, heart attack, a lower pain threshold, and a weakened immune system that results in more infections, colds, and influenza. Bob Phillips, in his book, Controlling Your Emotions Before They Control You, says, Dr. Henry Brandt, one of the nation's leading psychologists, suggests that anger is, anger is involved in 80 to 90 percent of all counseling. Uncontrolled or unresolved anger can lead to emotional and mental problems, including depression, eating disorders, alcohol and drug abuse, self-injury, low self-esteem, and moodiness. Anger contributes to marital instability and reduces parental influence and effectiveness. Anger contributes to social alienation, loneliness, and occupational instability. God wants us to avoid improper anger not just because it hurts others, but because it hurts the individual that has misplaced anger. Jesus said, after all, in John 10, 10, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus addresses the effect of anger on our speech. He says in Matthew 5, 23, And whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council, but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Jesus takes this topic up again in Matthew 12, verse 34 through 37. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. God does care about the language we use and the way we speak to others. We will have to give an account of every idle word that we speak in the day of judgment. So serious is abusive speech that it is listed along with sexual immorality and idolatry as sins that, if left repented in a brother, preclude our association with them. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, 11, But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Albert Barnes writes in his commentary on the railer or reviler that he's a reproachful man, a man of coarse, harsh, and bitter words, a man whose characteristic it was to abuse others, to vilify their character, and wound their feelings. It is needless to say how much this is contrary to the spirit of Christianity and to the example of the Master, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. We can diminish anger and its effects not only by what we say, but in how we say it. The wise man writes in Proverbs 15, 1, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Proverbs 15, 18 reads similarly, A wrathful man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger allays contention. Men are sometimes fond of quoting Proverbs 21, verse 19, Better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. 
But the Bible also says in Proverbs 26, verse 21, as charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The father gave his ill-tempered son a bag of nails and told him that every time he lost his temper, he was to drive a nail in the back fence. The first day, the boy had driven 37 nails into the fence. Gradually, he began to get his temper under control. He learned that it was easier to control his temper than it was to drive those nails into the fence. Finally, the day came when the son didn't lose his temper at all. He told his father about it, and the father suggested that his son now pull out one nail for each day he was able to hold his temper. Days passed, and the young boy was finally able to tell his father that all the nails were gone. The father took his son by the hand and led him to the fence. You've done well, my son, but look at the holes in the fence. The fence will never be the same. When you say things in anger, they leave a scar just like this one. You can put a knife in a man and draw it out. It won't matter how many times you say, I'm sorry, the wound is still there, and a verbal wound hurts as bad as a physical one. Sage advice. Notice at the same time the great value that Jesus places on reconciliation in Matthew 5, 24 through 26. Jesus says that if you are worshiping God and realize that you have offended your brother, you should stop what you're doing and seek first to be reconciled with your brother. Jesus addresses the flip side of the issue in Matthew 18, verse 15 through 17, where he commands the one offended to confront the one who has offended him. The apostle strikes at the root of the issue in 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? This commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. The final words of the Old Testament, Micah 4, verse 5 and 6, prophesied that the Christian age would be an era of reconciliation. We're assigned a role in that process. Inappropriate anger works against us. The keys in achieving these goals involve lowering our expectations and demands of others, cultivating greater humility, resolving not to be so controlling, taking responsibility for our thoughts and actions, and placing the best possible interpretation on the words and actions of others. Stay with us after our song, and we'll tell you how to get a copy of this message. Jesus
like to make something available to you for free, a free 20-minute in-home tutorial on how to study the Bible. Sometimes you feel like, well, they're giving a lot of answers, but they're not answering the right questions. Well, we'd like to help you find the answers to the questions that you're asking us. We're so thankful that you've joined us today. We hope that you will watch the program every Lord's Day and then join us for worship at one of the congregations that will be listed shortly. You can call or write for a DVD copy of number 834, The Danger with Anger, or you can call or write for this free in-home tutorial on how to study the Bible. We're also offering a free copy of the booklet, Innovations in the Church by Wayne McCamey of McGregor, Texas. We hope that you're enjoying our series on the Sermon on the Mount. You may also request a free six-lesson Bible study by mail. Uh, we close with the words the Apostle Paul issued in Romans chapter 16, verse 16. The churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.